So um, let's get straight into it. We're talking about political history as opposed to personalized stories. Uh, for myself, I think the events of 1949 uh, defined my life. It certainly defined the lives of my parents and their whole generation. 1949 is when the communists took over China and all of the previous government of China, which uh, was called the Republic of China, all retreated to the island of Taiwan. So that's like the whole US government being taken over and everybody moving to Puerto Rico. Okay, it's, that, that's a good analogy, pretty, pretty good analogy. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. In 1949, uh, close to two million people moved from China to Taiwan by, by air, by boat, any way they could. And it was uh, assumed that Chiang Kai-shek on the left here would lead an offensive and take back the mainland, and recover the mainland is what we called it, from his adversary Mao on the right. And of course, that never happened. These events are extremely traumatic for our, my parents' generation. My mother actually uh, said she, when she was growing up in uh, Ningbo in China, there, there, weren't many, uh, there weren't many peaceful days. You always had air raid si sirens, and they were from the Japanese, the war with the Japanese, after which the war with the civil war with the communists came. So it was one war after another. And, uh, and then one, one row after another of migrations, displacement, and the big one coming in 1949. So uh, this has become a lot of content for a lot of my plays. Uh, and I, I examine myself and say, why is this so important to me? And I guess it's my parents' generation, how, how much I see they have suffered and, and how much they've gone through. Uh, and of course, now it's just a sort of a footnote in history, the what we're talking about, the Chinese Civil War of 1949. Uh, when I see images like these, uh, they were very influential in, in some of my, play, my earlier plays. So uh, let's look at, Okay, this is an absolutely tragic scene that you're looking, but what I thought to do was in my play, Look Who's Crosstalking Tonight, which is comedy. Crosstalk is a, is a stand-up comedy. I thought to make a comedy out of it, okay? So this is a strategy as a playwright to work with the tragic and traumatic events of history and turn them into personal stories that are funny for what reason? Okay, is that isn't that sort of taunting history, or isn't that isn't that a way of uh, being very dis disrespectful to to everyone? Let's have a look at uh, how I some of the things I did. Okay, um, let me read this. This is it's it's stand up comedy. It's it's like Laurel and Hardy, uh, and you know who's on first. Uh, and this play was performed in 1989 and and was extremely successful, the most successful play from Taiwan ever in those days. And it toured, in fact, it toured San Francisco uh, in 1990. So there's two characters, Bai and Yen. And Bai uh, is from China, and Yen is from Taiwan, and they're on stage talking together. Every age leaves its own characteristic goods. He's talking about 1949. I see, I see, so why did it all come at this time? It was chaos, you know, because Bai's family had a pawn shop, right? Those gold certificates, silver coins, you could own them today, but how much were they worth tomorrow? You had no idea. Yeah, I heard that commodity prices rose pretty fast. At the rate of a few times a day, at the time people were paid their salaries in stuffed rice bags. Sounds great. What are you talking about? It was so much cash you couldn't carry it home. Then what? You had to call a rickshaw. By the time you got home, prices has gone up again, so you had to leave half of the bag in the rickshaw for the fare. My God. At the time, my mother had just had me. Congratulations. My father wanted to buy two eggs to strengthen her body. Very good. He went to the market. How much are eggs per pound? How much? We're not dealing with pounds anymore, just eggs. So how much is one egg? 150. 
150, that expensive, are you sure you got it right? How much? 200. That vast? So by the time he got out of the cash and counted it, boom, the price rose again. How much? 250. How could he afford that? So he couldn't, so he changed the strategy. How? He decided to buy a chicken. A chicken. Chickens lay eggs, and eggs, eggs produce chickens. Okay, how much for one chicken? Not much. 30,000. 30,000. Does that chicken sing? Who had time to sing? You hesitated, so now it's 35. 35,000, that's ridiculous. You want to debate it? Of course, it doesn't make sense. Then make it 40,000. 40,000, can you give me a little discount? Okay, I'll give it to you for 45. So hurry up and buy it. There's no sense in hagging, haggling on. Problem, not enough cash. Not enough cash? There was only enough to buy a drumstick. Then hurry up and buy the drumstick. Couldn't. Again, hurry up and call timeout. No timeouts remaining. Then what to do? In the end, they struck a deal. My father bought a piece of chicken ass for 55000 to make some soup for my mother. What? The merchant left, felt pity for him and gave him 3,000 worth of scallions to add a little flavor. 55000 for a chicken butt. 3,000 for scallions. What the? Oh, okay, okay, enough. It, it wasn't you. What are you so worked up about? Right, right. What the hell do I care? Then... It got to the point where one silver coin could only fetch 500,000. So what was the most valuable thing at that time? What? A boat ticket. A boat ticket? A boat ticket to Taiwan. Escape. But that was something money couldn't necessarily buy. You had to have the connections. Really? My grandpa was looking for the connections. He wanted to send my dad to Taiwan. So go already. It wasn't that easy. Yeah? We weren't big officials. Right. We weren't military dependents, right. We weren't nationalist public servants, right. Unlike you, pointing to him. I'm sorry, okay. So this is a little excerpt from, we're joking at our own very painful history uh, of, a, of a moment in 1949 when everything, all prices went up. Uh, I may have exaggerated it a little bit, but actually not. Uh, people tell me, you, uh, particularly in Shanghai, how um, how it was so difficult to, in those days to really make a plan for what you actually wanted to do. So when I saw these images back when I was writing this play in the late 80s, this was the time when finally, after 40 years, almost 40 years, people from China and Taiwan could finally meet again, be in contact with each other. The, the Chinese Civil War basically stopped all of the communication between Taiwan and China. It was like worse than the Berlin Wall or anything. You just, you couldn't possibly make a phone call. You couldn't travel. There was no, no post, post office letters you couldn't send. So nothing. So that's why I say my parents suffered so much is because they had no way to contact their families. They were in Taiwan. In fact, my, my parents were in America. But there was no way they could possibly that they could know what happened to their to all of their loved ones. And all you could do would be reading the newspapers and saying cultural revolution, people are getting killed randomly. So it's I, I think a lot of that trauma comes from the uncertainty of you don't know what happened. It's like, I mean, if you know what if you knew what happened to everyone and there was some sense of uh, you know closure, that's one thing, but you don't know anything. And so this is how I, I saw my parents as I was growing up. This tremendous sense of uh, sorrow within them uh, that they couldn't be in contact with, with any of their loved ones. So in this play particularly, I decided to make fun of it, okay? Because that's maybe one way of looking at it. If it hurts too much, you might as well laugh at it. Let's look at another Later in, this, in that whole scene, which is scene one, Bai's, father, uh, Bai's grandfather finds a ticket for his father. So his father goes to the docks in Shanghai. My father grabs his luggage and departed for the dock with a heavy heart. He thought, this morning I had just had a locksmith change the lock on the family safe, and here I am ready to depart on a long voyage. What year, what month will I return, I do not know. In tumultuous times, one is not one's master. When he got to the dock, my father took one look. Over 10 ships were bunched together. He found his ship and started waiting in line, ready to board. But little did he imagine the dock kept getting more and more crowded with people. The later it got, the more people there were. They all wanted to board. Before long, the docks were jammed solid with people. That many? 
The numbers grew in correspondence to the speed of inflation that day. What did that look like? On every person's face was written fear and anxiety. My father's anxiety level started to grow in fear that he could not get onto the boat. What was he worried about? Didn't he have a ticket? What use was a ticket? You couldn't even get close to the gate. What happened to the rules of civil conduct? My man, when the large regulations of society break down, the little regulations go with them. You want to escape. Everyone wants to escape. Makes sense. So start working. Every man for himself, damn it. If you saw that whole situation, you could see how people behave in a turbulent environment. Th this is a special wisdom that we Chinese have. Tell me about this special wisdom. So, gesturing, everyone was jammed together, right? Suddenly came the sound of someone behind you with a big towel and a boiling hot pot with the sparks flying. He shouts, hot, hot, behind you, coming through, weaving his way through the crowd. Order of hot pot for the customer on board. Here comes the hot pot. His voice stretches in, until he fades out. What happened? He got on. He got on. After he got on, he found the spot, sat down, and had the hot pot all to himself. How infuriating. A few moments later, you could see these four guys, four of them. Right, they were carrying a stretcher, utterly beyond themselves with anxiety, screaming, coming behind you, out of the way, emergency, life at stake, weaving through the crowd of people. One more minute, if he takes his last breath, breath he will be morally accountable. Whoa. He stretches out as his voice and fades out. All four got on? What do you mean four? Oh, five, seven, seven. There were three of them on the stretcher. What? They also brought a little dog. That's what I call morally accountable. Okay, so, <laughs> so this is one way of looking at a tumultuous era. This play, by the way, was so popular. I, I, I'm a little embarrassed at it. It, um, it had a it came with a recording of it on cassette tapes that sold over a million copies, uh, sets, which is two million copies. So uh, you could see how people really wanted to have a dialogue with people on the other side of the Taiwan Strait who, who they hadn't seen in 40 years. So we talk about personal histories in, in these incredibly tumultuous times, and they get so buried amongst all of the big headlines, the personal lives of people get, get just get scattered. I just got this photo this morning, so I put it in, um, from a friend of my family's. That's, on the left, that's me, okay? That's my father and mother. Uh, my father was a diplomat in, in Washington, D.C. for Chiang Kai-shek's government. So you could see he's smiling there, but uh, I had I have gotten to know him as a, know him as a very very serious and always in a, in a line in Secret Love in Peach Blossom Land, which is one of my more famous plays. Uh, the wife of the main character says in Secret Love says uh, I I never could understand him. He always he he wouldn't drink the tea that I made for him. He always wanted to drink his own tea. And then he would sit by the window, and we wouldn't know what he was thinking of. And that was my father. That was my father all the time, just sitting by the window and just looking, staring out with his tea. So, um, I, I mean, this looks like a very nice couple in Washington, D.C., and uh, well-dressed and everything. But these are displaced people, and um, they're working for the government that has been <laughs> really, 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 really displaced and, and difficult. So um, just to show you that, because we'll, you, you'll see some of these characters, like my mother, in the village, okay? Because the village is, uh, is about a different, uh, a different part of society, but actually it's all, it's all one society in, this, in these times, because everyone went through the same fate of being away from their, their families. So let's look at a, a serious way of looking at this displacement. Secret Love and Peach Blossom Land, as I said, probably my most famous work. Um, the man and the woman are lovers in Shanghai in 1948, and then they get taken apart by the, by the uh, chaos, uh, and they never see each other again until uh, 1986 when we did this play. Uh, I wrote the story that um, 
some people were able to make it to the mainland and because it'd been almost 40 years. And so people were tired, they're getting old, and they're saying, look, I'm going to just break the rules if, if, if that need be. And so um, some people just went to China and said, lock me up, I don't care. Uh, and then they found information about their loved ones. And so this man who is dying in a Taipei hospital, he asks his friend to find the information about his, his first love, his secret love. And the man comes back to Taiwan and says, you know, this woman, I found out she also came to Taiwan in 1949. And you didn't know, nobody knew. They, they actually all lived in the same city and didn't know that. And of course, this man now is married. He has kids, his wife. He puts out a, he puts out a huge advertisement on the front page of the newspaper uh, which of course his wife sees searching for searching for this woman and it creates a big embarrassment in the hospital room the nurse is the nurse is really enjoying it she's a young young woman and she's going wow wow let me tell tell me about these things what who is this woman you know and and all he's got is this faded photograph of her and the whole play goes through and five days later uh the woman still hasn't shown up at the hospital room. So the man is really, he's really down. He's, he's sort of like a wounded animal ready to die. And his wife is trying to console him. But at that, at that moment where he's quarreling with his wife saying, just leave me alone. I don't want to go out for a walk. I don't want to, just leave me alone. The knock on the door comes and the nurse opens it and this woman is there. And she says, um, is there Mr. Zhang here in this room? And then very tactfully, the nurse takes Mrs. Zhang away. Says, I can, you know, you can uh, do your hospital bills. I can help you now. And she says, I can do that tomorrow. I can, oh, and she goes. So the two of them are left in the room together for the climactic scene, which is, is a very, very iconic scene in Chinese theater. Uh, we did this at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival a few years ago. And, um, I found that yes, uh, crossing cultures, it's still, it still is very, very powerful. So the woman sits down and amongst the dialogue is this. Uh, let me, this is like maybe a, a third of the way that they're into the, their dialogue because it's very awkward, right? Um, what do you say? So Jiang is the man. He said, I didn't know you were in Taipei. And Yun says, I didn't know either. She sees Jiang's scarf. That scarf, these years when it turns cold, I wear it often. This is a scarf that she made for him, knitted for him in 1948. So as an actor, the two actors, this is a great scene because then you just, I tell my actors, whoever does it, just take your time and let the silence fill the room. You know, you don't have to say anything, you know. So when, when he says, these years when it turns cold, I wear it often, just nod your head and wait until you feel like talking. You've lived in Taipei all these years? Since early 1949, I wrote many letters to your home in Quimming. No reply. 1949. Everything suddenly became so chaotic. We had to make a choice to stay or go. My brother decided to take us all out. With a truckload of other refugees, we fled China overland through the Burma Road. After many detours, we arrived in Bangkok. Then we went through Hanoi to get to Hong Kong, where we stayed in a camp with other displaced refugees. Two years later, we were forced to come to Taiwan, and here we stayed. Silence. When did you see the newspaper? What? And of course, the what is feigned. You know, of course, she, of course, she knows she heard it. When did you see the newspaper? To the day it came out, silence. How is your health? Good, had a small procedure done the year before last. Nothing really, getting old. Last year I became a grandmother. I still remember those long braids of yours. I cut them the year after I got married. What a long time ago. And again, the silence fills the room. Where do you live in Taipei? When I first came, I lived in the Jingmei district. 
When we first came, we lived in the Yonghe district. It's about five miles away, by the way. Then we moved to the Tianmu area, which is on the other side of town. A few years ago, we moved to the Mingsen Quarter, which is also on the other side of town. Long silence. And the man says, hard to make sense of it. In a city as vast as Shanghai, we could find each other. In a town as small as Taipei, we were lost. Yun looks at her watch. I must be going. My son is waiting for me downstairs. She stands and walks slowly to the door. As she grabs the doorknob, Jiang calls her. Yun, I need to ask you, all these years have you ever thought of me? Long silence, and she finally turns to face him. I wrote so many letters to Shanghai, so many letters. Then one day my brother said to me, you can't keep on waiting. If you keep on waiting, you will grow old. Silence. My husband is a good man. He really is. Zhang offers his hand to Yun. Yun approaches the wheelchair and takes his hand. Their hands clasp together for a long moment. Then Yun lets go. I really must be going. She goes. And Zhang is alone. And that's the scene. And this is my way of, of honoring my parents' generation with a serious scene instead of being very flippant about it. <coughs> Excuse me. And this scene, believe it or not, this scene was created in one, in one rehearsal. So uh, I use improvisation as my main tool for writing plays. And Secret Love and Peach Blossom Land is a very complicated work because it's two plays. It's Secret Love and it's Peach Blossom Land. There's a serious play and then there's a farce. And they're trying to get control of the stage because they each think they're booked for a dress rehearsal, but they can't find the theater manager. And of course, people think that's a, some political comment about the two Chinas or whatever. But anyway, you see the comedy, you see the, you see the serious play back and forth, back and forth, fragments and bits. And finally, you see this scene. So we waited, all of the cast, we waited until the end. All the other scenes had been developed and were really good. We waited to do this one scene. And we scheduled it for this afternoon where Peach Blossom Land people didn't have to come. They're a different cast, right? <clears throat> but they came anyway. They all wanted to see what was going on. And the man is Jing Sijie, is probably one of the most famous. He turned out to be one of the greatest actors on the Chinese language stage. And the woman didn't because uh, she stopped acting. Uh, she's my wife, Naizu. Uh, she became our producer, but she said she did this role because there weren't any people in those days. There weren't any, any, <clears throat> any actresses. And <clears throat> she, would <clears throat> she would have fun with that and say, you know, <clears throat> she took the role because it saves budget, you know. But anyone who's seen her in that scene knows it was the most amazing thing. And that afternoon, we did this improv <laughs> where I told them, okay, you all know what's going on. All I, w I just want you, you guys to get into your roles and then please don't cry. I hate it. I, I, I'm going to kill you if you cry. So the wife and Jiang are fiddling with their wheelchair and then, and then I give the cue to, for, for my wife to, to knock on the door in the rehearsal room, which, is, which was my kitchen, by the way. I'm sorry, my, my dining room in my house in those days. And so the nurse opens the door, and then we, we go. And then from that moment on, everything that was said that day was taken down, and nothing changed. In one improvisation, we got all of these lines in perfect sequence. And, and they didn't cry until the end when he offers her ha his hand to her and she goes to him and we couldn't help it everyone was crying you know it was like uh, I, I i surrendered i said okay that's those are truthful emotions i'll take it um and later right after the improv was done each of them went into a different room you know they just couldn't they weren't able to talk to us for about 10 minutes it was so powerful and emotional and then later, my wife told me that she felt that it was the whole generation coming through her, like she was a medium. And that whole, the whole generation, her mother, 
her parents are from from Yunnan, you know, so that the whole thing just coming through her. The, and that's what I told my actors at Oregon a few years ago. I said, when you do this last scene, you are actually channeling the the um, trials and tribulations of millions of Chinese people. So remember that. And they did a great job. So these two examples of what 1949 has meant to, uh, to my work, let's go on to a third, which is uh, the, top, the main topic of today. In Taiwan in 1949, when all these military people came, you had to have housing for them. So um, the government built these rows of very temporary houses, and they call them Juanchun, which is a dependent village, meaning meaning literally a dependence village. So anyone with a with with a wife or kids, you would stay there. And they were very small. They were, the the units were like let's say this stage here would have maybe five units, each unit being maybe oh I'd say twelve feet by twelve feet. You know that's that's your house, and you're there. And at the beginning, people were okay with it because everyone thought they'd be going home soon. No one thought that they'd be, be there forever. And as, as the time went on, every year we had this, in hindsight, very ridiculous staging uh, on January 1st where everyone was at the, the presidential mansion and Chiang Kai-shek would come out and, and say, you know, shout with me. Today we are raising the flag on the new year here in Taipei. Tomorrow we will be in Nanjing. And everyone goes, yeah, Nanjing, you know. And then year after year, the sound gets a little weaker and starts fading out. And, and then maybe 15 years later, you know, he, he stops doing it. And, uh, you know, and, we're, and these people in, living in the military villages, hey, they're having kids. Their kids are growing up. They're teenagers. They, and they're still in this very small space. And, 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 that's, and they live there forever. They have no idea that this one temporary housing would be lasting for 50 years. And that's what it was. 800 some villages were erected in 1949, 1950. Today we have like one of them left. This is kind of the spatial, I couldn't find a great picture of, of then, but now this is, this is like how crowded it is. And of course, you see this alley has already built, people have already built up fences on, in front of their houses, which would, is a little ridiculous because that would give them a yard maybe three feet deep, you know, but <laughs> they did it. So also in those days, you would have a lot of writing on the wall, all these slogans about recovering the mainland and all this stuff. And of course, in you've, uh, class, you've read the village and you know there's one line in it that says, um, the bigger, the bigger the, the words are, the more, the more lies they are, the more, you know, impossible they are to accomplish. So look at the writing on the wall and anything that's really big means that it's not possible. Yeah. So today I said, there's one left on the right hand side. This photo is, uh, if you know, Taipei, you see in the background, Taipei 101, which used to be at one time was the tallest building in the world. And very modern, ultra modern, and and there is one village here that has now become sort of a, a village museum. You can visit it if you visit Taipei. It's very close to 101. And um, many of my friends came from this village, uh, which used to be a huge sprawling village in the center of Taipei. And in those days, it was the outskirts. So what came from these villages? So many people came from these villages. Politicians, gangsters, we, we say both sides of, of everything. Um, entertainers, um, uh, if, if you've seen the film version of The Peach Blossom Land, Bridget Ling, the most famous superstar of the Mandarin cinema, she's from a village. Uh, Deng Lijun, Teresa Deng, the most famous songstress of the, of the era, uh, also is from one of these villages. So. Um, there's something special about people from, from villages. They're, they started out, they start out being very, uh, shy that they're from a village, because if you say you're from a village, that means you're, you're probably poor and 
you live in a very cramped environment and it's something, it's not a confidence builder. But it's amazing that after our play in 2009, people are proudly coming out and saying, I came from a village. My village is, was where so and so. And there's a new pride in, in, all, in this whole history and there's a whole interest in this whole history just from one play. So this play, let's talk a little bit about it. Um, it chronicles how these people uh, came to Taiwan in 1949, how few of them knew each other. And in fact, uh, one of them gets married to a Taiwanese girl and he can't even, because she's pregnant, and he can't even uh, communicate with her because they speak different dialects. Uh, so the, the set was just a simple three houses that are, that are linked together. And we take out all the, the, the walls. And notice in the center home, there's a telephone pole. Okay, and this comes from a real story, uh, one of my friends. Because the first scene, there's only, two, uh, there's only two houses. And then this guy comes and he talks to one of his friends who lives stage right and says, um, not bad, you did good for yourself. And, and his friend says, so what about you? Where are you living? Well, you know, actually I have some responsibilities now. What happened? And he shows the girl who is now pregnant with, you know. So he says, and, and, and the kind-hearted Mr. Zhao who lives stage right, he says, well, you can stay with us. And of course that's impossible. There's no room, right? But he says it anyway. It's a very Chinese thing. I mean, just to be very, very compassionate and say, you come on, stay with us. And he says, no, 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 no. So what? So, you know, you have this space between you and the neighbor. And he says, yeah. Well, you know, I could use this space if you're okay with it. And he says, but there's no roof. Oh, you just put a roof over it. But there's a telephone pole. That's okay. It's, I can, that's better to get power from it, you know. And, and so this guy actually builds a roof there, and, and that's the third family. So it's a story about three families, and then their lives over about 40 years of, uh, 40, 50, 50 years, actually. Uh, and then their offspring and everything, and, and finally they will be uh, going home, and the village gets dis destroyed in the end. Very, people noted that it's all about these very um, down-to-earth and very everyday characters. Uh, this is a scene about uh, some, one of the families got a TV and then they pull the TV out into the yard so that everybody can, can see it. And one of them goes to a contest and so the whole village is watching. And then the second generation grows up, has their problems. Uh, the one on the right goes to the city, becomes a bar girl, and then meets a, U a United States GI and gets married with him and goes to Las Vegas. Everyone starts, it starts spreading out all over the place, these people. Uh, the one on the left, she e eventually grows up to uh, marry a, a guy from the opposition because military families are usually very, very staunch uh, nationalists. And then if, if somebody from, from a village is from the other party, which is the opposition, which is the Green Party, then it's very, very strange because those people are more interested in Taiwan being an independent country, whereas people from the village would want Taiwan to be re, re, reunified with China. So you see these uh, political problems. And this is the scene about the white terror where one of them gets apprehended for no reason at all and the scene where they all go home. It's a three and a half hour play, very long. This is the scene with the pilot when he comes back. Uh, and this is a, actual, actually a real story of a friend of mine whose father uh, was a fighter pilot and then his plane crashed in China and, and he was uh, thought to be dead, but actually he was taken by the, the Chinese and put into jail and branded a spy. Uh, and then many, many years later he came out and uh, his mother eventually was, re was reunified with him, but 
it, it's a sad story because they weren't able to be together. Uh, and the guy who was such a hero, like he was like a fighter pilot and a real hero, he, he became sort of this, just this old man with nothing left in his life. Uh, so many stories like these that I would be hearing as I grew up uh, in Taipei. This, the play ends with this uh, celebration as they are going to take, destroy the, you know, demolition crew is coming in to destroy the village. And the main, one of the main characters, Mr. Zal, comes back. He's actually dead, but uh, his son sees him and, and he delivers a farewell letter to, actually it's a letter that he wrote when his son was two months old that he forgot to give to him and was stuck in one of the pillars there. So, um, I want to talk about this guy on the right, Wang Weizhong. He is the guy who got me to write this play. He is from a village. He is one of the most successful uh, TV people in Taiwan. He's, at one time, there were like 10 television shows on running that were his. Uh, so he's like the sort of like the godfather of the Taiwan uh, entertainment uh, industry. And we knew each other kind of casually. We weren't too close until one day he called me and said, look, let's make a play about the villages. And I said, okay, but um, I don't know how because, uh, I mean, there's so many stories about villages. What do you want to do? And he said, let's, let's meet for coffee. And so we did. And he brought one of his assistants and he told, started telling stories nonstop. He told... In those two days, he told a hundred, hundred some stories about twenty-five families, and he was so enthusiastic about all these very funny and very sad things that that uh, happened as he was growing up. And most of the stories I knew, because I've I have many friends from villages, and I spent a lot of time visiting these villages. When I like after school, friend would say, "Want to come over?" Sure, and I would come over, and I would go, "Wow, you know, this is this is your house." And, and, then, and then when dinner comes, that's the interesting thing. You want to stay for dinner? Um, I didn't see anybody preparing dinner, you see. No one was preparing dinner. And I said, but uh, yeah, yeah, come on. And then he would go out the back door into the back door of the neighbors and just sit down and we ate. And this was, this was life in the villages because it was so close in proximity. Anything you say could be heard by, by the neighbors, you know. And, any, and Wang Weizong, Weizong told me that he, uh, growing up, he could go to any four, fa four houses for dinner, wherever he wanted to. You know? So it was great for kids. It was, it was, ho it was really terrible for the adults. Uh, but for the kids, it was great. You would just run to the next house. And, or just, you, nobody locked their doors. You would just walk in you know, and say hi. Everyone called everyone uncles and aunties. You know? So auntie, you know, what's for dinner? Oh. Uh, and then, you know, of, and of course, everyone was poor, and maybe they didn't have much dinner, but they sh certainly shared everything. So it was a, it's a very special experience. And I told him, I said, look, a hundred stories, each are great, you know, that, I'm sorry, that doesn't make a great play. And he said, you have to, you have to do it. I said, you, look, you're a television guy. You do television. You make a series, right? It's 100 stories. You do it. That's perfect for you. He said, no, 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 no. And he said one thing that I, in, in retrospect, I think, I think he was probably just saying it for, to appease me. But he said, only theater is immortal, he said. Television is fast food. You know, theater is immortal. Uh, I said, come on, let me think about it. I don't think I can do it. Because how do you put a village on stage? And how do you do hundred some stories? And then I started telling stories and I, got, I added 50. 50 of those stories were, were, a lot of them were from villages. Some were from my parents, my parents' generation, which I was watching and seeing them through their trials. So I said, 150 stories, this is not gonna happen. So it took two years while we were all busy with other things. And he kept bugging me periodically, saying, let's do it, let's do it. I said, I'm sorry. I mean, I would, I would love to, but I can't. I can't figure out how to do this. And then there was a moment when, when we said, actually, my wife intervened and said, are you guys going to do this or not? Because if you're not, um, it's time to release the theater. 
you know, because we had the National Theater for, Octo uh, for December that year. This was like in March. And I said, okay, let me give it one try. Let me go into retreat and see if I can write an outline for this. Okay, so I, I set up a three-day retreat where I would just do, I mean, be no contact with the outside world. And then I examined all the stories that we had and I started putting them in like baskets. You know. So it turned out that the 25 families were reduced to three and the hundred some stories were reduced to 48. So they were combined, some were discarded and some new stuff came in and I had an outline and I called him and I said, I think we can do this. And he said, sure, that's great. And I sent it to him and he didn't say anything. So a week later, I called him again. What the hell is going on? You know, he said, no, it's great. It's great. You know, I said, why didn't you call me? He said, because it's great. Yeah. And there's nothing I wanted to, to add to it. It's perfect. You know, so there we, we, actors had heard of that. We were doing this. And so many came and offered their services. Many, many wonderful actors, mostly who came from the villages. So this was the first opportunity that any of them had had and myself included to really write about the history of our own time. Secret Love is not totally that way, it's quite fictional. But the village is, uh, the village is, is something that really deals with our, our own times. I'm sorry, this is in Chinese, but let me, let me show you the difference between the outline and then the final scene, because I know many of you are interested in the way I work. So let me, I'll translate this for you. This is uh, from Act One. This is called, the scene is called the first uh, New Year's. 1950, New Year's Eve. And we're talking about Chinese New Year's, which is like late January. The three families are, the, so we've set up the three families now. The three families are busy, each preparing their New Year's meal. They all think that they can make some more to give to the neighbors, but they don't have any money to buy food. So they all uh, prepare the meal according to their hometowns. They come from all over China. And so the Zhao family, uh, under the direction of the old lady, are doing dumplings. They're making jiaozi, dumplings. And the wife is, uh, she's complaining that none of this stuff in Taiwan, she's from Beijing and she's very arrogant. Uh, she thinks that none of the stuff in Taiwan is good, good enough to make dumplings. In the second house, the Zhu family, Mrs. Zhu is uh, pregnant and she's making Taiwanese food. In the third family, Mr. Zhou isn't making, isn't cooking. He has uh, his friend, the pilot, the fighter pilot, Li, who brings her wife over and, uh, they, and they bring food for him from the officers, from the officers place, the second part. Zhu, uh, Mr. Zhu goes to the other house, to Mr. Zhao's, to uh, borrow some salt. Mr. Zhao says, let's everybody come over to his place to eat. It's going to be much more merry. So they all move their little uh, stools or, or whatever to the Zhao family. And everybody starts tasting each other's dishes from all over China. Mr. Li, the fighter pilot, and his wife also stay. They're all very happy. The wives start telling their stories, but the happy, uh, the happy atmosphere does cannot um, cannot uh, uh, hold back their nostalgia for their homelands, and everyone thinks of how they had their home, their the last uh, New Year's in their hometowns. Mr. Zhao, who is always optimistic, says, don't, don't uh, be sorrowful. Very quickly, we're going to go back to the mainland. So the men start talking about what they heard, information they heard. When are they, when is the, when are they, we're actually going to go into action, et cetera, et cetera. What happens, what's happening in China to prepare for their attack? The last one. It's late. Someone has thought of a song from the hometown and faces the hometown's direction to sing. 
everyone else joins in, song, singing the songs from their own hometowns. So this was my outline written about a few months before we actually started working on the play. And this is what I do. This is an outline I write. I, all the, audio, uh, the actors have it, and everyone knows who they are. And this is a massive scene because it's so many people. It's hard to improvise on because you get in each other's way. When you're, when you're improvising, normally I don't, I don't do an improvisation more than three people. But uh, this, this was a lot of people, so I'm, I'm controlling it more. And so actually I think we got the scene, I think in one afternoon. So let's look at the scene. We, I, have a, I have a video of the scene. Let's see if, how we can play it. They can't understand each other.你看我连砍枝都穿上了长官你吃的啥东西啊 他这个千金大小姐怎么个骗出来的呀<笑> 那边只剩下一副了嘛一起到老那儿走了是这样的
，上我那儿吃吧。啊，我弄了张大桌，你们拉张椅子过来就行了，好吗？你快过来，啊，快过来，啊，来来来，来来来，一起过去。来，老吴在等我。哎呀，不好意思了。什么不好意思了？走了，来了。刚刚那个赵大哥，他的岳母是北平德福轩的老板娘。啊，德福轩的烤鸭很有名的。对对对，大娘。哎，来来来，跟大家介绍一下，这是我们的空军英雄，恭喜恭喜恭喜恭喜恭喜！大娘大嫂，我同学带了这个腊肉来了，哎呀，恭喜恭喜！来来来，我告诉各位啊，这我妈包的饺子要多吃点啊，在北平要吃到她包的饺子还得付钱呢。我妈包的饺子要多吃点啊，在北平要吃到她包的饺子还得付钱呢。啊，付钱付钱，如意呐，红包拿出来付钱。来来来，别别别，开玩笑，千万别。别提你儿瞎说嘛，过年呐一定得吃元宝的，来，大家快吃。开始，哎呦，做嘛呀？怎么了？真好吃啊！你讨厌讨厌吧你！大<笑>娘<笑>，你这是包什么馅的？说正经的啊，来台湾之后没吃过一顿这么好的啊！他讲的，真好讲哎！啊，这是台湾话，客家就是好吃啊。哦，客家客家客家客家客家，长官呐，我同你说呀啊，这饺子啊，马馅都不是呀。台湾呐、啊，这也没有，那也没有，面粉不对，醋不对，大家呀随便吧啊，凑合凑合。大娘，你要醋是吧？哎，什么醋？你说吧。还有麻醋啊，就北平的醋嘛，我们就管它叫醋醋醋。北平的醋一坛。叫子康飞过去的时候再把它带回来就好了吧？你吹牛，你这小子！<笑>那可不，不客大娘啊！平常我都是刻意贴着重症飞，现在呢，我只要把飞机头偏那么一丁点啊，我就可以在北平 landing 了。Yeah. <笑>我要山东大萝卜，大萝卜还有呢。我要我要北平的冰镇酸梅汤。酸梅汤，您、yeah. 记下来，记下来啊！我都记下来了。开张单，元宵前交货怎么样？你这是等着我打。开始开始啊！元宝，哎，各位，今天是我们到宝岛的第一个年夜饭。是，这离家虽然远了点可气氛就是不一样。嗯嗯。我先恭喜大家，也希望大家呢，明年一块儿回家过年。回家过年，回家过年，来来来，来来来来来。我老实说啊，很多弟兄到了过年，特别是相亲戚，我担心有人撑不住，想过去了。子康，你放心，我们一定要撑住，很快就打回去了。我是山东铁达的好汉了，可上船的时候啊，看那陆地是越来越远，越来越小，然后就没了，我就哭了。喝酒，喝酒，喝酒，喝酒，喝酒，那个咱喝酒，喝酒，喝酒，喝酒，往好处想。这是咱们来台湾的第一个，但也会是最后一个年夜饭，对不对？要回去了。是的，是的，是的。哎，大家，你看这外头天这么冷，大家聚在这儿多温暖呢、啊，是不是？赵先生、赵太，你们真幸运，娘在身边，我们的娘都不在身边了。像子康，两年都没见到他娘了。大、啊、娘。嗯，你今天就代表我们所有人的娘，对了，咱们敬您一杯，好，敬您一杯，来来来来来，谢谢，大家恭喜，身体健康啊，长命百岁啊，长命百岁，新年快乐，新年快乐，新年快乐。说我我们大家的娘，呃，我们的妈妈都不在身边。啊，不过我阿爸不用抓住的家，你是讲吼，我是让人赶出来的啦。没有没有没有。哎呀，哎呀，呃，这句讲的太长了，我听不懂。<笑>肯定是骂你的，就听不懂了，对不对？哎哎哎、家在东北种花江山，哪、嗯、里有森林美矿？还有那。满山遍野的大沟高粱，我的家在东北松花江上，那里有我的同胞，还有那衰老的爹。
说北平在哪个方向？那边。嗯，我很久没飞了，我也不知道。子康，海文，子康，大陆，哎，北平吗？是。我先问，我家上海在哪里？先找到北极星，往西，再往西，顺这个方向，上海。长官，那北平呢？先找到北极星，往东，再往东，北平。我们山东青岛呢？再往东一点，山东青岛Experience of the play. Um, people experience it as uh, <clears throat> laughing, and then quite soon after crying, and a lot. It just goes on and on. And um, as you see, the the final did not turn out the same as the outline, and that's what it's all about. That's what the creativity is all about. You think it's going to go this way, but it, then it goes another way. Let's look at what happens next. Uh, Mrs. Zhao, who uh, Mrs. Zhu, who is pregnant with quite pregnant, goes to next door to learn some uh, how to make food, Chinese food from the uh, old lady. The old lady teaches her how to make baozi bao. Okay, and uh, suddenly they hear a, a telephone ring and they hear crying, uh, and they go out to see because. It's already been established that late in the afternoon, often if you hear a telephone and then someone is crying, that means one of the planes has gone down. And in this improv, all I told them is, you don't understand her, she does not understand you. Not a word. And I think we got this scene in maybe 15 minutes. It was, it was pretty easy. Uh, the, the title is wrong, but the, this is right. Um. Um. Uh. 你来做啥？哎呀，朱太呀，干啥嘞啊？知道我今个要包包子啊？来，我教你。嗯，我过去。来，我教你，我教你。哎，来来来来。真老早呀，真心啊啊！算是给我找到对的发粉啊，可以包包子，千金包子。哦，包啊，包子，我猜，我猜，我猜。你说嘛呀？不是普通包子，嗯，是天津包子。我娘家呀，是天津人，天津味呀。啊，来，我教你啊。我说呀，见面呢，先搁在旁边，让他心一会啊。我们呢，先来做那些。我说啊，这天津包子是有诀窍的呀啊。里边呢，要包肥肉、瘦肉。那节是要根据季节的变化来做调整的。季节啊，嘛叫季节？你懂吗？<笑>你怎么傻笑呢？啊，这四季呀，春夏秋冬，四季呀，季节啊。<笑>这怎么说呀？这，啊，好比呀，现在现在是夏天嘛，天气热啊，你流汗的啊。你这肥的呀，跟瘦的比例得抓多少呢？你得抓三比七，三七啊啊啊啊啊！那等到冬天，天气冷啊，天气冷啊，你肥的呢就多些，你就抓四比六。哦，我知呀，你的意思是讲天气那不讲错话就不讲哦,哦。你别着急嘛啊。我先教你啊，现在是夏天啊，我先做三比七的，你看，等到冬天换你做四比六的，我吃，好吧？啊，我爸母是来做煮菜的，啊啊啊啊啊！啊啊<笑>还有啊，这葱姜蒜末啊，全下去了啊！我妈妈说呀，这天津包子就是你吃的时候。
骂味都有，但你依旧说不出是骂味，<笑>这就是最地道的天津包子。天津包子，我妈妈教我的。天津，我家，我老家。嗯，天津，你知道吗？啊，家，我家，家呀。天津我家，我老家，天津卫呀，天津卫，天津卫，我家，我老家。啊、嗯，西安呐，回不去喽，回不去喽，我呀。是没法回去老家了呀！啊<笑>、嗯，你你卖艰苦啦！哎，那那个还做啦？你你给我做些哎哎哎，天津包子啊！嘿嘿嘿嘿嘿嘿嘿！韭菜是天津包子，哎，天津包子啊！<笑>老雷，我叫你来。我说是酱油啊。It's just like the times, which really、um, are funny and so sad. 哎呀，大嫂，哎，长官好。In the winter, the old lady passes away. And、Mrs. Zhu makes ball for her, for her、uh, altar. And the pilot that we just saw,、um, he's plane has crashed in China, and so the widow is, taking, is being taken care of by the friend. That's how they take care of each other. So let's go on to the because we're running out of time. The last. Climactic scene. Let's just look at it from、uh, the end of the play when they all are old and go home. Oh, sorry, this I can. Xiao Huang Shi. Can惜，我的父亲没有赶上一个新的时代。大陆开放探亲，后来这几年，村子里几乎所有的人都先后回去，包括我的弟弟，他也从台北飞回北京，去看我们的奶奶。他跟我说，北京的马路好陌生。好陌生，可奇怪，又好熟悉，好熟悉。更奇怪的是，老家的人都不姓赵，都姓杨。That happened in the first act. 还是啊，来来来来来啊！前面那个就是你老家，水大院胡同。奶奶一大早就起来等你了。来来来，我们这边走，这边走。Mr. Zhao has already passed away. 奶奶啊，谭生回来看你了。啊，谭生，哎哎，谭生别杵他，奶奶，我进去进去，这儿走这儿走啊。您的孙子来看您了，过来，爸爸他，爸爸他，奶奶，奶奶，大爷没事想要来的，但他没赶上这个时候。
，我就替他来了。这是要孝敬您的，孝敬您的。哦，这个是我们在台湾的相片，这个是爸刚到台湾来的时候，这是我妈，还有这张是我们全家福的照。巴掌是你替你爸爸爱的。当年他跟我说，他只是去台湾玩我。这一玩就玩了四十多年呢、啊。奶奶。啊阿朱，哎，到了，我们到了，到了啊、哎！这是你家、哦？哎哎，这不是我家啊！啊，不然我们来看谁？等一会儿要见的那个人啊，哎，他的年龄比你大啊，所以你要叫他姐姐。啊，是你姐姐啊？他不是我姐姐，对，他是你姐姐。你在乱七八糟讲什么啦？进来吧，进来吧。哈哈哈哈哈！这当不是我自己要去的，他们就把我给带走了吗？我的天！进来，进来，进来！孙子，孙子，抱着，抱着，抱着，抱着，抱着，抱着，抱着。大姐，你好。哎，我有带一些东西来送给你们的。这个哈、哦、是台湾嘉义最有名的金铺子打的，拿着，拿着，拿着，水晶的哦。太贵重。不会啊，坐下，坐下。啊，啊，这也是我们台湾哦，嘉义的名产呐、啊，方块酥啊。对对对对对。叫二妞。快叫快叫快叫快叫，二妞。对了对了，好，好。好，来。你也有。拿着拿着拿着。来，通通都有。都有都有都有。啊。哎。这里的金孙了哈，你做阿公安呢？哦，好能干哦哈！大舅啊，阿拉个这边走，这边走啊！大舅。大姐，阿弟，大姐，阿弟，东西哪里？东西哪里？弄过的好吗？哇好，房子收回来了，弄先生呢，阿拉才收得到。能住下来吗？阿拉不住了，在台湾住习惯了嘛。大姐，这些年侬吃苦了。没有，没有。爸爸妈妈他们带我去他们的坟上看看，好吧？昨晚弄的一只小好嘞呀！啊
周贝贝的姐姐带周贝贝到上海近郊，在他们父母的坟前上完香之后，周贝贝突然问他的姐姐一个问题。原来，在修祖坟的同时，他也请他的姐姐帮他修一个老朋友的坟。小杰，哎，带我去另外一个坟上看看好吗？可以啊，那个叫啥给啊？那卢汉是吧？他是谁呀、啊？哎呦，阿拉想起来了，他是脑关小同学，那个高高帅帅，时常来家里吃饭的那个。我去台湾之前，他摔飞机死了，是那个卢汉生于一九二八年五月十九日，没于一九四九年九月十六日。小汉，当年我把飞机开到台湾之后，就再也没有飞过了。因为从你出事的那一天，我就已经跟你一起死了。可是为什么我还活到今天呢？也因为你说过的一句话：人生要开心，尽量开心。即使只剩下一个人，也要开心。小弟，小弟，好，走了，走了，走了。I guess we'll let the play speak for itself. It's um terrific. 时间过去了，嗯，呀，很多事情是不会改变的。Just quickly, um, we give a bow to everyone who has seen this show. At the end of the show, they get a bow doll, a village bow, um, and we've performed everywhere in Gaoshan. We've performed to fifty thousand people. Uh, we've done America, all over. It's been ten years now, and we're still going strong with most of the original cast, most of which which came from these villages, and that's why you see the powerful acting. Is because this is this is their story, it runs in their juices. So um, that's about it. We're at one thirty. So uh, thank you very much for seeing this, and yeah, thank you. Thank you.